Man, what a week of interviews we've had. Just the other day, we had the GOAT himself, JJ, Jim Johnston, on the show. Today, we've got Double J, the two-time Hall of Famer, TNA Hall of Famer, WWE Hall of Famer, Jeff Jarrett. You guys have all said a lot of very nice things about my interview with Jim Johnston, so thank you so much for that. It was, it was such a pleasure preparing for that interview because I got to listen to his entrance themes all week long. And they sounded so much better on this bad boy right here. If you're looking to upgrade your speaker game, you gotta check out this Bluetooth speaker from Co. Because this isn't just any Bluetooth speaker. Check this out. This is a split Bluetooth speaker. It pairs instantly with your smartphone or your tablet or your computer. And just like that, the awesomeness is about to begin. If you smell what the rock is cooking. <laughs> Man. Together, it's such a great surround speaker, but you split it apart. Well, you can have one in the bedroom and one in the kitchen. You can have one indoors and one outdoors. Oh, sorry. Got a little caught up there for a second. Seven hour battery life on one charge, and I had it at the beach last weekend because this thing is water resistant. Man, what a great theme song. All right, we'll pause it for a second. Guys, this Cove Bluetooth speaker is seriously next level. And because they're sponsoring today's video, the deal they're giving us is so epic. 67% off with that discount code down below, CVV. If you love music and you love hearing entrance themes sound that good, it's simple. Click that link down below. Use the code CVV for 67% off. Yes, okay. we have met, but it was a long time ago. Got it. But Got so, it. congratulations! Wow. Welcome to the show, by the way. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate and you having me on. We were we were just catching up before we hit uh, got going here. We have met. Uh, it's, that's, uh, it's, I, I no, all kidding aside, you do great work, man. Um, not your ordinary average interviewer. So, well, uh, I, and I, I hope I, I'm not your ordinary average interviewee. Absolutely not. I appreciate your time today. Congratulations. You're, you're going to start being on this side of the microphone. You're, you're a podcaster. Do you ever think you would have a podcast? No, I, it goes without saying, and it, it's well-documented, uh, especially uh, Conrad knows this. I, Chris, I, from a business perspective, yes, you can learn from the past and you must learn from the past, but you, you know, I've always been thinking forward, uh, raised in the business, no matter how good or bad, your last match or storyline or, or whatever it is, deal, it's in the past. Move on. You you, you got to be better next week and, and next week and next week. So I've never really looked in the rearview mirror. And then certainly growing up in this business, being in locker rooms and car rides, look, I've told a lot of stories and I said, I'm not interested in really telling these stories again. Yeah. But with the world we live in and on-demand entertainment and the, the business model that goes around it now, uh, it's, it's fascinating to me and I'm excited because, um, you know, Conrad has a unique way about him that, uh, dives into the story. And that, that's something that, that highly interests me. Uh, there's in our industry, as you're well aware, uh, lots of narrative that swirls around different things. And look, I was a wrestling fan and I've said it many, many times. I was a wrestling fan long before I was a wrestler, a promoter, a referee, any of that. Um, and so I love uh, the industry in that aspect that whether you're whether they love you or hate you, just keep talking. And, and that's so true. That, that is so true. So I'm excited uh, about launching my world and, and everything we've got going on around. You know, you touched on it a bit there, but you've done everything in the wrestling world and you've worked pretty much everywhere. And I'm very curious to know, Jeff, what's the thing that you're most proud of in your career? Ooh. Uh, perseverance, M maybe the perseverance, because this is not an e easy industry at, at, at all. I, I'm, I've, I've got, uh, I'm one of five kids. I'm the only one who got into the industry. My grandmother, um, uh, her husband, my grandfather went off to war and he made it back to the States, but he didn't come home. So she was a single mom of two um, and went to get a second job and because she had to raise two kids. And her worth ethic was passed on to my father and passed on to me. 
And she started out selling wrestling tickets and worked her way up in the 50s and 60s to what we would call a CFO. Um, and so, and then my father got into this business as a high school kid, promoted, and then he married and had two kids and then got out of the business and then got back in just for his love of it. And, and then again, I'm, I'm, I'm one of five and, and getting into this industry. Um, many folks have said early in my career, your father being the promoter is either the greatest thing for you or the worst. And matter of fact, I agree on both. It, it is a blessing and a curse. Uh, but, but I've always loved it, got a passion for it. Um, whether I was always fascinated as a very, as a young kid, not only the entering product, but the marketing the promotion and concession stands and everything that goes around it. But, but, but I guess when I look back, I just celebrated 35 years. When I look back, whether it was the USW day, USWA days, WCCW, WWF, WCW, TNA, Global Force, Hall of Fame, all of that. When I look back on it now, podcaster, as you say, <laughs> the perseverance and the drive is something that um, it's up to me to get up every day and, and put on my work boots and go to work. And it's something that I take a lot of pride in. Do you think people know you more now for your in-ring work or everything you've done behind the scenes? I'd have to ask you that I, because, <laughs> you know, and it's funny, like just to, I don't want to do a sidebar here, but you know, my, my, I've got five kids and uh, my, at the time she was in eighth grade, she came home and um, on Instagram stories or something, the Beetlejuice guitar shot, which <laughs> happened before she was born. Yeah. But it, it was funny. That was sort of the entry point to, Oh, that's Jaren's dad. And she's like, what? And you know, she, her point of reference was really TNA uh, days. She, yeah. she had no concept of uh, slap nuts days, so to speak. Um, so I don't know. I'd have to ask you uh, what, what people, but I think a longtime wrestling fan sort of knows the different uh, generations, inter iterations. Um, I don't know. That's a good question, though. I love that you brought up slap nuts because I would call people that in high school all the time. <laughs> and I want to know what the genesis for calling someone slap nuts is. Well, a funny story here. So me and Conrad, obviously, it's a business. You know as well as I do. The podcast is a business. So we had to come up with, we had to name what our JV is, what our LLC is. And it's Slap Nuts LLC, <laughs> 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 which is funny. But uh, no, my grandmother used to call folks slappies. And that is people who slap their gums. They know more and more about less and less every day. Right. Uh, so just, you know, during that time and the slap nuts uh, just rolled off and Mean Gene and Mike Tanay and good old standards and practices of Turner. I, I've told this story before when they called me in at a nitro when slap nuts was really just first taken off. They were like, we need to ask you a question. And they were dead serious. Like what does slap nuts mean? We have looked in the urban dictionary and we cannot find it. I'm like, wow, this business has come a long way. I'm being questioned about where slap nuts came from. So. <laughs> I also love that you brought up the guitar shot because I've always wondered my entire life, what do you do when you give someone a guitar shot to make sure that they don't get injured? Uh, swing it as hard as I possibly can. And that's, that's the truth. Bat speed, uh, club speed. Um, no, the, it, it, the, you, you absolutely have to you got to swing it as hard as you possibly can. And that is something that, you know, this business is so transparent now, you know, saying somewhat with, 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 with a chair shot to the back, swing yeah. it. Um, when you stutter start, your edges can get in and look, I, I don't bat a thousand, but not bad. Uh, but uh, the accidents do happen. Um, as Kurt, uh, th there was a, there was a time where it's like I busted him open two or three times in a row, but it happens. But uh, yeah, which part of the guitar is gimmicked so it doesn't hurt somebody? It's gimmicked, Chris. Oh. What are you talking about? <laughs> Do you think I would swing a gimmick guitar? What kind of interview are you on? <laughs> uh, that that I tell you what, the, the best guitars are the ones. How do I say this? Look, there was a time in WCW that they ordered uh, truly L.A. based, movie set based uh, prop guitars that 
if there was a real good gust of wind down in Florida, you may have to be careful on that. Uh, <laughs> but the best ones are truly the, uh, I'll say, uh, a, a, a store-bought guitar uh, w- with a, a couple of magic tricks that I used to say, magic tricks done to them. That, those are the best. Ah, very interesting. What are three things that you wish you knew before you started TNA? Chris, this is why I love your, uh, you should have gave me a cheat sheet so I could give you good <laughs> answers and think through this. And, and, and we're not wasting time for me to think through this, but three things I wish I knew. Yeah. Well, I mean, it goes without saying, um, <laughs> I wish I knew about Jay Hosman and, and uh, you know, I could get into individuals. Um, one thing, uh, as a, I'll, I'll just say that, that maybe I can give you a, uh, uh, an answer or worth sharing, <laughs> sure. but, but from a business perspective, you know, when I started, I was 35 years old. Yeah. That's a young businessman for a startup company. Um, and that the, um, one show a week, um, oh, it's just one event a week, two hours. It, it is consuming. Um, and, you know, in 2002, we didn't have near the, 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 the tools and the capabilities of, of organization. You know, we're, we're here on a video call. Um, there's a lot that goes back, you know, phone calls. I used to say phone calls don't accomplish what a face-to-face meeting will do. Yeah. And, and I think FaceTime has somewhat advanced that. I don't think it completely replaces it. But the video component of body language, you know, they say, what is it, 72, 75% of all communication is nonverbal? Yeah. I'm a big believer in that, a huge believer in that. So time management is something in the early days of TNA. Uh, look, I'm, I'm in my 50s now, 53. At 35, my time management wasn't anything like it is today. It's, it's, it's progressively gone. But um, your question was, what are three things? Mm. Uh, time management would, would be one. Uh, two, uh, delegation um, uh, on, on that. And then um, probably right up there at the top would be something that um, that really I was born and bred, bred on in Memphis. Every Saturday morning, you do a TV show. If it's great, great. If it's horrible, it's horrible. Guess what? Less than seven days, you get to get up to the bat again and not hanging every decision and everything and thinking it's irreversible, irreplaceable, getting really hung up on single decisions uh, at the startup. But, but who knows? Look how it turned out. You know, the, the company's still around, but we were super successful uh, for a lot of years. What were the goals when you started TNA at that time? I, and, and we're going to get into this on my world. Uh, me and Conrad have had some different discussions over, uh, over the years, you know, obviously, the WWF times in China and, and the IC runs and the WC, you know, they're, they're all the obvious, but the startup years of TNA, uh, I went on a tour or a couple of tours uh, in Australia and the United Kingdom and saw the abundant amount of talent. Um, obviously it was to run a promotion, but again, I'm a third generation. So the, the single goal was to, to have a, you, you cannot have a number one without a number two. It's just wrestling. Yeah. And with WCW going away, not just kind of away, I mean, game, set, match. Um, the folks, it's well documented. It, it was over. It wasn't, hey, is it hanging around? No, there was no national promotion. I knew there was a huge void in the marketplace. And, and so the, the simple goal is, is to be a fantastic distant, distant number two, which mm-hmm. you can be super successful, successful. Avis, we try hard. They made millions upon millions of being number two behind Hertz. That's a real simple story. Uh, you know, McDonald's came on the scene. Guess what? Burger King came on the scene and they were successful. Oh no, don't start Wendy's. Oh, guess what? It shot to the top. I mean, it, it breathes success. It's the industry. I was such a huge TNA fan, especially like oh, uh, four, oh, five, oh, six. oh, massive. I bought, I was a huge AJ Styles fan. My favorite in ring wrestling match of all time is still AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, and Christopher Daniels in that triple threat. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, I, 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 a magical time. Where are you from, Chris? Originally from Toronto. Okay. All right. That's cool. Just, I always liked when 
the original TNA fan base, if you like, if it's 2002, 2003, 2004, it's pretty cool to hear the stories and folks in the UK. Anyway, we're, we're I'm getting down a uh, rabbit hole, but, <laughs> but, but no, I, I appreciate it. But yeah. Go but ahead. I always wondered how the evolution went from the four sided ring to the six sided back to the four sided. Was that your decision? It certainly wasn't my decision to go back um, at, at all. Um, and, and we're going to get into this on my world and Conrad, again, it's another one of those stories. He asked me almost the same question. He's like, what's that about? And I'm sitting in my home office and there's a picture of the six sided ring. And you know, I, it's no secret. I've traveled to Mexico, uh, Pena, uh, Antonio, a, a good friend of mine, um, a, a big part of the early days. Uh, he sent luchadors up here, which heavily influenced the X division and everything that goes with it. But I really love the six sided ring because when you looked at it, the world knew that's not WWE, that that's not WWE. Oh, what is that? And you got to remember those were the early years in a lot of ways of UFC, um, that, that, you know, the octagon, it was getting hot and just all those, uh, that, that whole vibe around it. And then the thing that was the, the game changer and, and, uh, we're going to get, really deep into the numbers on it was the action figures us getting shelf space in walmarts and back in those days god rest his soul toys are us but it, it immediately gave us a six-sided ring oh wwe doesn't offer that mm. we're taking it so mm. that just opens up a huge business opportunity and and i just thought it had a different vibe and set us apart now did it sell tickets or get ratings that no but it did set us apart from a business perspective. So how hard did you push against having the four-sided ring come back? I, I, my vote at that point was zero. Minority oh. owner, but I had zero vote in it. So you had no say? Zero. <laughs> uh, what do you think's the one match or storyline that a lot of fans or most fans will kind of direct your way in, in terms of questions? Oh, wow. Uh, in, in, in my whole 35-year career, I guess it depends on how old the fans are, right? That's what I'm saying is that yeah. just so, uh, there's different eras. And I've always said that, you know, my early days in Memphis and I had some really, you know, working with Lawler, who was my childhood idol. Yeah. I, I think his in-ring career, again, if you're a longtime fan, you know how good Lawler is. He a little baby face. I mean, he's, uh, in my opinion, right up there at the top. Uh, as far as a true territorial star, Memphis and the amount of tickets he sold. But anyway, those, and then, you know, I had a series of matches against the Moon Dogs. We didn't call it hardcore, but he was hardcore before hardcore was yeah. trash cans and boards and chairs. And then the IC runs and Shawn Michaels and that, and then WCW and the chaos and, and the world championships, but different opponents and Sid and, you know, I could go on and on. Then the TNA days, uh, me and Sting, that whole storyline, you know, with my wife being ill and, and, and Sting's a guy that really sunk his teeth into our organization. And to this day, um, it goes without saying, in a lot of ways, um, he, he was a game changer. He, he really solidified and, and got some momentum. And, you know, Christian Cage and Kurt Angle uh, and, and, and Team 3D and the list of talent that were rolling along. Um, so, and then in 2010, my series of matches against Kurt, uh, at that stage of my career with my business hat on, as much or more than my in-ring hat. We had uh, about a year uh, storyline that, that I'll put those matches up uh, against any in my career. And, and Kurt's timing, I knew he was good. Matter of fact, I knew he was great when I hired him. But but his his in-ring skill set is just unbelievable. His timing and his ear, uh, you don't really see that from, 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 you know, former football players or basketball players or, or amateur wrestlers. Um, Kurt's in-ring skill set is just incredible. So I don't know, Chris, um, you tell me. <laughs> I mean, your work with Kurt Angle was great and you speak so fondly of him, but obviously, you know, you had the other per personal storyline with Kurt Angle. How is your personal relationship with Kurt now? Look, and, and look, in my world, there's that, that's family. It's, it's personal, but it goes without saying, in 2010, I spent more time in the ring with him. Uh, he has spent Halloweens here at my house. Uh, look, you know, he, he has five kids. It's hard, hard to imagine, but uh, I've got three biological. 
Uh, he has five biological, uh, but but Karen and Cody uh, are with me and Karen. Uh, but it, it's it, it's family. Uh, obviously, we all have our ups and downs and ins and outs. But heck, I have that with my uh, buddy at the gym who who is always late and aggravates the hell out of me. So it is what it is. But no, did, you, did you think that would get turned into a wrestling storyline? No, um, no. The short answer is no. Uh, but but it did, and it transpired, and and look. That was um, that was a unique time behind the scenes, and I'm not talking about the personal side, the business side. If you look at 2010, 2011, uh, you know, uh, in that influence, and, and again, that, that you you've got your Conrad hat on. He, he can't wait to dig in to, to, to the, you know the, the story, the, the, yeah. the stories that, that go along with all of it. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be compelling. Is, are you worried at all to like go down memory lane with Conrad? Is there anything that's maybe off limits with Conrad? You, you know, when you say off limits, look, I, I'm, I'm here to tell my story. Yeah. Um, I've had as many mess ups, screw ups. Um, look, at, at this stage of life, you know, I wasn't ready to do this at 43 or whatever, 48. At this stage of my life, um, if there's one thing that somebody hears and, and says, that was a interesting story, but I'm going to take it and learn from it. Or mm. I, I, I've, I've, you know, again, uh, at this stage of my career, whether I can pass on a little of experience that I've had in the ring for, so a wrestler can hear it, or if it's a business tip and I'll tell you all the different ways I screwed up. Uh, I can tell you how not to do things. That may be pretty cool. But 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 at the end of the day, in the 2021 and beyond, we're, we're in this on-demand era of entertainment. And if I can entertain or be a part of entertainment, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. Because that's sort of the business I've grown up in is we are in the world of uh, sports entertainment slash professional wrestling. And a part of professional wrestling today Obviously, it didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago when I broke in. But today, the, 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 the art of podcasting or the, the genre of podcasting, that's as much or more part of sports entertainment as a headlock and a you know, tackle drop down, get it again. It, it truly is a part of this industry. I'm sure it will be an episode or, or multiple episodes, but your match with China, I remember watching this as a fan and from the outside looking at it, I went, that's a great match. And then I learned about everything that was going on behind the scenes. And I've always wondered, how did Vince know that you were going to go to the ring and actually put China over in that match? Brief, for, uh, restate your question. Cause I want to, how did Vince sure know that, you know, your, your contract was up. And you had this match, you had the Intercontinental Championship at the time, and you had this match with China and you were going to put her over. How did Vince know that you were going to actually go to the ring and put her over? <laughs> well, for one, he had already paid me. And I cannot wait to dig into this in my world. <laughs> it's going to be a hell of an episode. All the ins and outs and the build up into that. But it, it's like any promoter. He had to have a little faith in me, um, first and foremost. Um, and, and at the end of the day, He's been around a lot longer than I have. So what if it didn't go down? You've always got tomorrow's raw to rewrite it. So it, it, it sometimes as an industry, we get so caught up. How does he know? How do we know he's going to do it? Well, I'm banking on the odds and the probabilities that he is. I just paid him uh, his money. Uh, he's out of my headset. And, and to tell you the truth, uh, we weren't the main event, A. B, and here's something that we're going to dive into on my world. The following day is when he took his company public. So you can talk about WrestleManias, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10, 12, now 37, 38. But you can talk about WrestleManias. You can talk about SummerSlams. You can talk about his Fox Billion Dollar Deal and USA Network and all. You can talk about all of that. It all, it, it doesn't hold a candle to the day he went public. Mm -hmm. that, that As a businessman, he built a third generation business and he got it to the point in 1999 and he had spent the prior i don't know 16 weeks flying around the world talking to investment bankers to say i'm taking this company public a professional wrestling organization chris and that's what i don't think as a businessman look i respect vince for so many different things 
he took, you can call it the wrestling or whatever, but literally in North America, prior to cable television, there were 22 regional promotions. Mm. He took his company and WCW with all that story that went along with it, and Ted Turner and Ted, billionaire Ted and all that. He took his company and went public. That you can roll all the WrestleManias in one. Nothing compares to that day. And there's it was the a, day after this. There's a clip on YouTube where you're speaking with Karen about being inducted into the Hall of Fame and you're talking about like who you're excited to see backstage and you start talking about Vince and you get super choked up. So much that you have to go off camera to like wipe your tears away. Why does Vince mean so much to you? You're going to give me a, you know, look, I'll never sit in his shoes. I mean, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm not giving the comparison, but I'm saying his father was a promoter and, you know, had the ins and outs and his mom and all that, his grandfather. So, so growing up in this business, being a part of it, the fiber uh, and, and all of that and knowing everything on his plate. I mean, you take it all in Fox, NBCU running this, running that. Somebody said this on the internet. Oh my gosh, the warehouse lease is coming up. I mean, you, you name it. He runs a billion dollar organization and he didn't have to make the decision to, to, to put me in the hall of fame. It's that simple. Very humbled by that. I mean, it, you know, yes, it's a TV show. It, it, that's what we are as entertainment and, and just all the decisions, the good, the bad, and the ugly and all that. But, but, and again, uh, some people don't know that that video that you're reflecting on was like at 610, 620 in the morning, the crew showed up and they hit me with that. And, and I wasn't prepared for it. Not that if, if I would have, I wasn't prepared for you asking me for it, but you know, I've got so much respect for Vince that, that I was incredibly humbled and, you know, the crew showing up and pulling in and them coming in and we're shooting that. It was, um, it, it, and everything that I'd been through uh, leading up to that point, uh, it was an incredibly humbling moment. Did you ever think you'd be able to bury the hatchet with Vince? See, and that is something that, that when I told Conrad this, I said, look, when we're, we're going to get into it in one of the first couple episodes, look, Vince didn't have to pay me the, the night of the China match. He, he's the promoter. He's the boss. I, I didn't, you know, Jeff held Vince up. Really? What, with a 38 or a 45? I mean, come on. I mean, that, that's so preposterous. Um, but he gave me the check. I went, did my, I, 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 you know, I try to give my effort as much as humanly is in me each evening. And I did it that night as well. And the storyline that had been built was, was marvelous. Um, but getting that opportunity, Vince, we hugged that night when I left. So, so, so bury the hatchet in my mind. I never thought that when my wife got sick, Vince called, um, in the early days, I had conversation with Vince, with, with Vince about TNA. We're businessmen. So, so, so the, the, the Jeff Vince story, mm. so, so, sorry, Chris, there was nothing really there as far as burying the hatchet. But with that being said, it's a business. So why bring the guy who, um, ha has been on the other side of the fence for 20 years? Why do it? Yeah, he did. Yeah, it's fascinating to know, Jeff. And I'm curious if you were talking with Vince about TNA starting up, was there ever any chance that TNA and WWE could ever collaborate together? And not in those days. You know, I tabled it. Is there something? Look, we were we were tiny. You know, I mean, but 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 hey, is there a way to work together? I mean, it goes without saying. Memphis was a quasi developmental uh, territory on its uh, on the dying years of USWA for, for Vince. So was there a relationship to be had? Were, was the only conversations. And and candidly, we got going and 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 there it's not like he said no or I came up with an idea that he said no to. Look, Vince has helped, you know, he helped Paul Heyman. He he's helped promoters. But Vince knows for the industry to be healthy, everybody needs to be healthy. Uh, and so there just wasn't anything that really came up that would crystallize into saying, let's do this. Yeah. I mean, you're third generation. You've got five kids. Is there any chance we could see a fourth generation superstar <laughs> last name Jerry? I don't know about that. I, you know, I, I don't know about that. That's, um, 
but who knows? Who, who knows? Um, all my girls are athletes and, and growing up ar- uh, around me and Karen and it, it's uh, showmanship, I guess, is in their blood, but we'll see. <laughs> I mean, is it something that your dad steered you into or steered you no. away? Not at all. Again, uh, I can remember my parents were divorced since I was age of three. So uh, up to about 12 years old, I lived with my mom, 13 years old. Um, I can remember watching the Andy Kaufman uh, storyline on my couch, just mesmerized by that, going to the wrestle matches. And and my dad wrestled, uh, I've told this story, Danny Davis and Larry Latham and and, um, uh, Wayne Ferris. The Moon Dog, Honky Tonk Man, and Nightmare Danny Davis, but they were Danny Davis and the Blonde Bombers. Anyway, th- those stories, my dad getting hit, just they wore his butt out with a ride and crap. So I was, I loved wrestling. I, I, I to this day, uh, and I've, I, I've often said I, I, I've been blessed, but I'd, I'd love to see somebody who's watched more live wrestling, not YouTube, not the network. I'm talking about actually watch live wrestling. I, I don't know that anybody, um, just because I've, I've, I've been around it for 40, 35 years, whatever. Yeah. So I love it. Uh, again, I love it. I know that you travel a lot with Owen Hart and I'm, I'm, I don't, I want to know what the one thing that you learned from Owen was during that time. Um, one thing, and I've said, I've said this, uh, a lot of people say, tell me a funny Owen story. Tell me a rib, tell me this. And I've got, and everybody has boatloads up. Yeah. But you know, the, the one thing, um, Owen, okay. He he taught me a not a a lot, but one thing that I think a couple of different things, but you know, integrity is one thing he, he had, um, you know, he didn't drink, didn't smoke. Um, I wish I'd listened to him back then. Jeff, you, I'm going to drink all that beer. And I'm opening my first, Jeff, you're going to drink all that beer. I'm like, Owen, I'm, this is one beer. Anyway, that was his sense of humor, but, but he knew how to take uh, a boring plane ride or a boring bus ride or a car ride. And you talk about make it entertaining. And so that in and of itself, that whether it's a good day or a bad day, we have an individual choice. Are we going to enjoy this day or not? And Owen did that day after day after day. You never really saw Owen down or depressed. So when I look back on it, that's one of the things that, that, that definitely rubbed off. There is no such thing as a bad day in Owens, uh, you know, on, on his travel days. But the integrity side of it and um, the, the human fiber of who, uh, how he conducted himself would be another thing, I, I think would be um, because he would stand up for what he believed was right. Um, in, a, in, in a very diplomatic kind way, but he stood up for it as well. There's so many stories that you guys are going to get into in my world. I'm so excited to hear it. <laughs> we, we haven't had enough time here, but I super appreciate you coming on, Jeff. No, I appreciate you having me on. Yes, I'm, I've, uh, I've seen your work. Uh, hats off to you, my friend. Um, it, there's a skill set, and I will say this. You know, it's like having my first match um, or, you know, as a promoter or – you know, our first spike show. Um, there, there's a cool story behind just the first. Oh, then we're going to two hours. That's cool. Um, whatever. But there's always these first. Yeah. Um, I, I've never been a podcast. I've done how many have I've done of these over the years? Loads. Yeah. But when it's me and Conrad, quote unquote, stepping onto the stage, there's going to be a first. So I'm excited. It, there is there is a newness. There's a there's a freshness to it. I'm doing the the, the PR tour. Uh, and, and chat about it from India to the UK. I, I'm really excited about all of it, but I do appreciate you uh, having me on. It's that simple. No, I appreciate uh, you coming on. I, it's great to catch up with you again. And Jeff, I end every interview talking about gratitude. I'm a big gratitude guy. So, why, I, okay. okay. Why, why is that? Because if you can be grateful in your life, and you not have expectations, just be grateful for the things that you've got. I think that you live a great life. I got it right here. Be great, be grateful. So I'm curious, what are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? My creator, God, Jesus Christ, my savior, and the Holy Spirit who helps me every day. But if you want to get even deeper, I, I'm, I'm really impressed by that. I, I guess I haven't stuck around long enough on your work on gratitude because gratitude is a game changer for me personally. Mm. Like, I, I could if, if we wanted to roll another hour, but we can't. But but uh, I got more interviews. But, but no, the, the gratitude muscle I call it 
mm. is truly the game changer because certain sayings that we don't have to do anything, we get to do everything. Yes. The, the, those little tr- those little things that, that, that when you wake up, I don't have to do anything today. I can lay in bed, I can go downstairs and sit on the, uh, be a couch potato. I don't have to eat good food. I get to eat good food. I don't have to exercise. I get to ask exercise. I, I, I don't have to, whatever it is, that fundamental mind shift, I believe at times is the dividing line between happy and not happy, joy and not yeah. joy. I, 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 well, we got deep real quick, but I'm really impressed you asked for that because the gratitude um, mindset, I, I personally believe, can be a game changer for anyone who takes a second to just think it through. It, 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 can, it can fundamentally, radically change your life. I couldn't it agree. Mine. And I think that if you trade your expectations each day for your appreciation of all the things that have happened and all the things that could happen, I think that that's how you live a great life. Buddy, if, if, if I were to look back over my 35 years and think about the different things that have happened and at the time, oh my gosh, that happened, that's the worst thing. Oh my gosh, that's a disaster. But in reality, problems are only opportunities that are presented to me to change me. And I have the choice. Is it going to change me for the better or for the worse? It's, it's, and, and the huge mosaic of, of when we look back over our life, the things that we think are the worst parts, they're really the catalyst for the best parts. The doors opening. It, it, it's amazing. That's, that's really cool. Uh, man, dude. That, that's such a good way to end this. Ah, oh, Jeff, I've really enjoyed this. Time. I can't wait to dive into my world with Jeff Jarrett. And again, just such a pleasure, such an honor to be able to catch up with you here today. You really, you were, you were a winner in my book before we started, but ending with gratitude and expectations and, and the pot, it goes down to positive mindset. We have a choice every day. We can be, we can, it's that simple. We can be positive or negative. I'm yeah. choosing to, to be positive today. And my friend, um, I appreciate you having me on. I'd love to come back on, uh, maybe year one or whatever the anniversary. And we'll say, uh, Hey, let me interview you on one of your episodes on the Chris Van Bay Van Lee episode. Jeff Jarrett interviews Chris. Done. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate your time today, man.